know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here is your host, Rev. Jeff Peterson. Well, today we are studying about after the birth of Jesus. You know, some of those things that were taking place shortly after Jesus was born. And so we call these uh, Bible readings Epiphany readings. You know, as we enter now after Christmas into the Epiphany season, season, Epiphany means to show or to reveal. And so what God is doing is that God is revealing himself to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. That God is no longer hidden, no longer veiled, but now has been revealed to us. So as we wonder, you know, what is God like? Who is God like? Well, the best way that he's showing it to us how he is, is that he's become one of us in Jesus Christ. And so we look at the life of Jesus, and then we learn the life of God. And we can relate to that. You know, sometimes the best teachers that we've ever had are those who will just kind of give those the hands-on. They will just jump in there with us, be that example, and to show us. And that is what God has done in Jesus Christ. But not only that, but certainly is unveiling all of his work, all of the things that he had promised throughout the prophecies and the law, the traditions, are all coming to life and they're showing its fulfillment. And we must remember that right from the very beginning, when God called Abraham to, to be the father of his great nations, is that... If you, as we read in Genesis chapter 12, that this is where it all begins as far as God's plan for his people. That God will bless Abraham and Sarah, that they will have many descendants, that they will have become this great nation, that God will bless them, that in turn, that all the nations will be blessed. Well, that blessing comes to a fulfillment in Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the, well, he's the promised one. That God is looking to not only just unite himself with his people, Israel, and to redeem them, but his plan is to redeem all the nations of the world, all people, all tribes. When I think about what is written in Matthew chapter uh, 24, verse uh, 14, that in the end times, when we hear about all these things, wars and rumors of wars, all these natural disasters and things that are going on, I mean, yeah, we can focus on all these awful things, but yet in that verse... We hear that something else is going to be going on, something else that is very positive, and that is the word of the Lord is going to all the nations at this time. That the word will go forth to all the nations, that all the nations will hear the good news of Jesus Christ, that even though bad things are happening, God's grace happens. That salvation is offered to all of us. That all the nations of the world now have that living water, that well, where they can go and they can draw the life of God in Jesus Christ. When I think about uh, what is written in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 and following, Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me from my birth. He has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. And I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, 
and my reward is with God. And so that's the prophecy of Jesus coming, that he's going to be like this, this arrow in the quiver. When you look at a soldier or, or you know, a marksman, a hunter, they all have the arrows in the quiver, and, but yet God's quiver that he has kept this one arrow it's the straightest, it's the sharpest, it's the greatest. And that is his son, Jesus Christ. And he's the one who hits the bullseye. He's the one who brings salvation. He's the one who fulfills all of what God has promised. He's that arrow that certainly is as straight as can be, as straight as uh, on line. He's our righteousness, bringing salvation to all the nations of the world. So listen, all you nations. Listen, all you races, all of you tribes. That we're all one in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that, I read from Matthew chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had come together, all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as he, you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. I like this story because right off the bat, Jesus is born, and somehow God is communicating with the whole world that something spectacular has happened. Yes, when we look at the Hebrews, you, you know, and we think about what what Paul said about the Jewish people that, that the law and the grace of God came to them first. Grace upon grace. But then in Jesus Christ, grace has come again to fulfill all of what has been given. And so when we think about so when we think about the Hebrew people, yeah, what a blessing. You know, that they were chosen, just like Mary was chosen. Chosen to be these special people for whom God has now poured into the world. And so, you, so they have been anticipating the coming of a Messiah for quite some time. But yet, in all these other cultures, in all these other backgrounds, in all these other religious persuasions, that God has also been preparing them. When I think about my heritage, it comes from the Scandinavian countries, and there's a lot of Scandinavian mythology. 
But Nicolae Grunfig, who was a great Danish theologian and pastor, he was talking about you know, all the Scandinavian mythology that God was using that to, you know, kind of, to kind of cultivate the soil, make the people ready to be able to hear the truth the truth about Jesus Christ, so that when the missionaries came, that there was a, rece you know, that there was a receptivity about them to receive uh, the gospel and to have it planted into their hearts. And so when we look at all the nations of the world, and as we look at all these different religions, that we see that there were these wise men from the east, the Magi. And we don't know, you know, I can't say for sure just exactly who they are, but normally when we think about magi that come from a land, you know, to Israel, for instance, or as we read in the Bible, is that generally they are advisors to the king. They're advisors to the throne. When we think about the Pharaoh, if you remember when Moses went before the Pharaoh and was doing all of those, when he was doing things with his staff, you know, to show that God is acting and Pharaoh, you better listen. Well, his magicians or his wise men, were, his magi, were able to duplicate a lot of these things. And he was oftentimes being advised by these people. It's like the president's cabinet. <clears throat> and so their religion, it would have been maybe more like a Zoroastrian kind of a religion that had uh, things to do with astronomy or astrology. And so they're always looking for signs in the sky, in the stars. I don't recommend that, that we start reading our horoscopes and looking for things in the sky, you know, to try to get some kind of a revelation, because the revelation now has been given to us in Jesus Christ. We have to look no further. It really aggravates me when I, you know, people are out trying to figure something out, or, or while wow, they saw some documentary on TV about some ancient religion or something that's going on in the sky, that they're looking for something new. As if there is something new. No, we don't need anything new. Jesus is the final revelation. He is the full salvation. We don't need anything more. And that's the tragedy, is that when we, when we give up on Jesus, then there, there isn't any truth. There isn't anything that now can bring salvation. Okay, well, these magi, they, they're coming, and they really here again made quite an effort to be able to, to go to all the way to Jerusalem, you know, a thousand-mile journey, a thousand miles probably on camelback. After all, they are animals that can go quite a distance, especially without having to drink a lot of water. But... So for these magi is that they recognized something in the sky to say, well, based on our understanding of things, that there is a, that there's a king that has been born to, in Israel. And having this spiritual sense of that this king is not just born for these people, but also born for us. I mean, after all, why would they make such an effort. I mean, you think in the sky, they could say, oh, you know, we just saw something up there that we think is, well, there was a, a king born to Israel or there was a king born to Egypt or, you know, who knows how many different signs they see to say, well, I think there's been a king born to whatever. No, this is a king born to the world. A king born for all the nations. And so there was this star, and so they were led by this star. And I've heard so many different documentaries on the star, and, and a lot of them are very compelling, a lot of theories. Matter of fact, now with our computers, you know, with computers and all the technology, now we can go back, and sure enough, in around this time, there was something spectacular that happened in the sky at this time. But here again, it's like a lot of the stories, you know, like Jonah and the whale, we get so caught up with the whale that we miss the whole point of the story that I think that the same thing can happen here with the stars, that we begin to argue so much about the star, just what exactly happened, how could this be, that we lose sight of the story. The thing of it is, is that these foreigners are being led to go to Jerusalem, and when they get there, they have 
questions. And they just simply say we've made this long journey and we basically have taken it in faith. And so they just have to ask the simple question, if you had a Messiah or a king born to the Jews, where would this king be born? Well, for the religious scholars of the day, for the religious leaders, matter of fact, most people would know that based on their prophecy, if you read in, well, if you read in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it is given. And that is what is quoted here, is from Micah. And so what they... So when they asked the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they quoted from Micah, saying that the baby will be born in Bethlehem. And so that's where the baby will be born, or if you're really thinking that you go to Bethlehem, you don't go to any other community but Bethlehem. And it's just like, well, that's all we needed to know. We're, we're just trying to look for some clues here. But also this is put in there because... God, or Matthew, his gospel, he's writing it, you know, putting so much prophecy to show that prophecy is fulfilled so that, so that the Jewish people can come to believe that, yes, this prophecy from Micah chapter 5, verse 2 has been fulfilled, but as you study all the way down the line, that all of this prophecy is being fulfilled. Now, King Herod, King Herod the Great, who was the ruler over four uh, different regions, and they were Judea, Samaria, Galilee, and Adumia. Those were the four regions. And for the most part, everybody seemed to like King Herod, because after all, he was a good administrator. I mean, everything is run well. I mean, the last thing you want to do is wake up in the morning and find that there's nothing but chaos outside of your door. Well, Herod made sure that everything was in order, but also he had all these wonderful building projects that were going on. And, you know, for the most part, everybody was basically singing for he's a jolly good fellow. He was even adding on to the, and making the temple even more luxurious than what it was. But yet, King Herod, like a lot of rulers, a lot of kings, is that they are very suspicious. Suspicious, paranoid, always looking over their shoulder, wondering who is trying to usurp me, who is trying to be mutinous and overtake the throne. And what is oftentimes so sad is that sometimes it's even children children of the king who are trying to do this. Well, King David would be been an example of this. And so Herod was no different as that even if there was a child of his that he was suspicious, thinking that they're going to try to take over the throne, he will do away with. Okay, now Herod is feeling just a little bit like a fish out of water because he knows that he's ruling over the Jewish people. And they have their heritage and they have their lines and and there are religious people, and God is acting, and, and all of a sudden it's just like, okay, I'm doing just fine until I have to deal with their God. And that's what's happening here. Oh, did I hear that there's a king that has been born to these people? <laughs> and he knew that as far as their beliefs and their traditions and, and as far as in their scripture that the kingly line has to do with King David, and King Herod knew that he was not of the line of David. And now he's hearing that there was a king that was born in the line of David? Oh boy. I have reason to be concerned. Now, a lot of people would say, well, how small can Herod be that, that he's intimidated? I mean, it's almost like a cowardly king that he's intimidated by an infant? Well, here again, when there is a prince that is born, 
They protect that prince because this is the future king. They protect the prince. And that prince will sometimes go to, well, they will go to, onto the throne sometimes at a very young age. I mean, there's accounts where sometimes the king is even brought to the throne. Well, like King Josiah, one of the great kings, at like age eight. And so Herod is thinking, you know, things are going well. I've been assigned to this region. I'm doing good for the people. You would think they'd be all patting me on the back. Why do you need another king? But it's like, oh boy, I'm not going to, I'm going to nip this in the butt. I don't care if this child is an infant or not. He's going to nip this in the bud. And so the first thing he does is he tells the Magi, well, <clears throat> if you find out, if you find this little baby king, come back here and let me know because I too want to worship this little baby prince. Well, the Magi, they go down to Bethlehem and here again, they're following the star. And I, in all the theories that I've heard about this star, I, I don't believe that. It almost sounds like, like this little star that's kind of just leading them. I, what I like to believe is that the star is the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that is guiding them to Jesus. Because that's how God, that's all of our star. If we're wondering, how do I come to faith? Well, we pray for the Holy Spirit. We pray for the Holy Spirit to be within us and through his word that he guides us. I mean, that's what's happening here, is that what's guiding them is the word of God, that the Holy Spirit, and guiding them by the word of God, that prophecy based on Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Okay, so they're there. Sure enough, they were correct when they said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And so when they get there, what do they do? They aren't saying, oh, we should take some pictures. I'm being facetious and report back, but rather they worship him. So what does that say? That people from other lands, other religious backgrounds, other cultures are worshiping Jesus. The newborn king, yes, when Jesus was born, the shepherds went into Bethlehem and they worshiped uh, Jesus, they bowed down to him, but now we have the Magi who have come and have bowed down to them. And as we look at it throughout history, that there will be all kinds of kings and all kinds of nations who, and rulers who will be bowing down to him. And so the question is, is that we bow down to him. And one of the things is that they brought gifts. And I think that's customary. When a king is born or when you visit a king, is that, well, you bring gifts. It's funny is that these magi are honoring Jesus like he is born of, of some noble birth, of some noble line. Almost thinking that, well, he's got to be in some palace, and here he's in this little town of Bethlehem. You know, you think that he would have been born in Jerusalem. I mean, that's where you know, all the great... Well, that's where all the, the great castles are, so to speak. At Bethlehem, a stable. And so they bring these pretty impressive gifts. Gold. Well, that's a gift. And so all these represent something. The, the, gold, the gold represented, that's a gift for a king. Frankincense, this incense, that's a gift that is given to, well, to a, to a priest. And myrrh is given to one who is going to die. A very costly perfume. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so what does that say about Jesus? Is that for them, this is, you know, coming here, that's prophetic. These magi, these wise men from the east, their gifts are prophetic, saying that, yeah, Jesus is the king, Jesus is the high priest, and Jesus is the one who's going to die on the cross for us. I mean, here again, just in these gifts, you got the message. 
So Jesus is our king, king of kings, lord of lords. He's the high priest that enters into the most holy place now and has brought atonement for us that we may enter into the very presence of God, into his heavenly kingdom. And he does that, well, not with a big army. He doesn't have a big occupation. He doesn't have, you know, any money, material things. He does it with a cross. Well, now, we hear about angels in the story where angels... Well, they go to Joseph and they warn him in a, or they warn him in a dream often and or they are assuring Joseph in a dream it's okay to take Jesus as your as your child. You know, you, you marry Mary and you raise Jesus. And you then another time where the angel warns him saying, Well, take Mary and the baby Jesus and you flee to Egypt. You take refuge here because Herod has really now uh, gotten out of hand with this whole thing where he really is trying to put Jesus to death, where he goes and kills all the, the babies, uh, two years uh, or children two years of age or under, around Bethlehem to make sure that Jesus is killed in this process. But that fulfills, you know, that fulfills the, the prophecy from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, that it's out of Egypt that I've called my son. And if you remember, that's where God's people were in refuge. And it was out of Egypt that God's people go. But now it's out of Egypt that Jesus comes. And after the threat, then Jesus, um, Joseph took Mary and Jesus and eventually then went up into Nazareth where there he was raised. But the Magi were warned by an angel in a dream to go a different way. Don't go back to Herod. And so they were wise in this. But how many times in our lives, we're just kind of going down life's path. You hear so many people talk about, I'm going down life's path. And the Holy Spirit and, and the word that I come to faith. And now my life has taken a whole new direction. And that's, you know, the way that it is for us. Is that when we come to know Jesus, we... Our life takes a whole new direction where we worship the Lord. We follow in his ways. Uh, we try to do our very best to please him and to know that this direction, this path, leads to God's heavenly kingdom. It leads to eternal life for me, not just for me, but for all the nations of the world. You have been watching To Know Christ with Reverend Jeff Peterson pastor of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Buttville, Wisconsin. For a donation of $15 or more, you can receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, Prayer, a practical guide to getting God's direction. Thank you for watching, and tune in again next week for To Know Christ.